thank you all for coming. Welcome to Stanford. Uh, my name is Roland Vogel. Uh, I'm executive director of CODEX, uh, the Stanford Center for Legal Informatics. Uh, our center is a joint center between a law school and a computer science department. Uh, our mission is to bring information technology to the legal system and make the legal system more efficient. Uh, there are a broad range of uh, projects carried out under the CODEX umbrella. Uh, our core interest uh, lies in the area of uh, computational law, and by that we mean uh, research and development of uh, technologies where um, computers can actually understand legal concepts and engage in legal decision making. So, so we have a, a very exciting program ahead of us. Uh, the future law conference was actually for over uh, one year in the making. So. Uh, it's uh, wonderful to see so many familiar faces and, uh, and new faces here. Uh, some people traveling from as far as, um, as India and Brazil, so, so it's really wonderful to have you all here today. So uh, it's, uh, it's hardly any news to any one of you here that uh, the legal system is undergoing massive change, and uh, much of that change is, uh, is driven by uh, technology. So, uh, so legal technologists are basically asking, you know, uh, what to do to accelerate that change and, and uh, drive out ever more uh, inefficiencies from the legal system. Uh, policymakers at the same time are asking uh, what they can do to support the use of uh, legal technologies to uh, provide for more access to justice. And, uh, and legal professionals are basically um, trying to not get their, un uh, their lunch eaten. And, uh, and they increasingly look to technology as a, as a path out of the current, uh, current crisis in uh, the legal profession. So uh, the program that we have put together for today uh, focuses on the big project of uh, building a better legal system. And by that we mean a legal system that, that serves all its stakeholders and not just uh, specific groups. Um, we have uh, panels of leading innovators in the field, uh, including lawyers, entrepreneurs, uh, technologists, researchers, investors, um, and government folks, uh, discussing topics ranging from you know, opportunities and challenges uh, of making the law more computable uh, to applying human-centered design to the legal experience. So uh, well, I'm sure we all agree that um, uh, legal technology uh, promises you know, great benefits to society, you know, perhaps as we go through the day and listen to uh, our speakers, uh, we should also think about, you know, what are some of the less obvious um, institutional challenges and uh, social obligations that we ought to consider as we progress towards a more and more computable legal system. So, uh, so one of my uh, great privileges uh, in my job is to work with uh, a group of uh, very uh, talented people, uh, the people who are really, um, driving the innovation in the legal space. Um, and uh, one such uh, very talented man is uh, Tim Huang. Uh, Tim has really been the driver and uh, the producer of this event. Um, and so please uh, uh, join me in thanking Tim for doing all the hard work that he's done and uh, bringing us all together here today. So thank you, Tim. So. So also a big thank you to, uh, to Trish Gertrich, uh, who uh, runs the, the Stanford Law School Program Group. Um, and uh, her colleagues, uh, Jackie Del Barrio, Jody Carrion, and Aaron Lee, who, uh, who have done really uh, tremendous work in, in uh, putting this event together, making sure that things are actually happening. So, uh, so without further ado, I'll uh, turn it over to Tim, who will introduce our uh, first speaker. Uh, hello, I won't take up too much time this morning. Uh, good morning. Um, my name is Tim Huang. I'm the junior partner at Robot, Robot and Huang, a law firm that some of you know about. Um, you might have noticed there's sort of a ridiculously retro font that we're using uh, on the schedule today. And you may be wondering about whether or not Codex is just sort of out of touch, but it's actually a deliberate reference. Um, Dan Katz, who you'll be hearing from later today, has kind of referenced these meetings as uh, a homebrew computer club for the law, um, referring to the group of people that kind of spawned the PC revolution uh, a few decades back. 
Um, and in that spirit, I think no one represents that spirit as much as uh, Charlie Moore, who is uh, the founder of uh, Rocket Lawyer. Um, and uh, he'll be opening us up on the keynote today and we'll move immediately into the first panel. Um, the idea for the day is to keep it fairly conversational. Uh, so during these panels, if you, you know, feel the urge to make a comment, definitely uh, raise a hand and I'm sure most of the moderators will be uh, excited to kind of call and kind of bring the audience into the overall discussion. So without further ado, Charlie. Okay, bear with me. Uh, he said to hit escape and right, press right. that button. There we go. That's who I am. Okay, a bag of money. Uh, thanks, Tim. Uh, you, you have done a phenomenal job of pulling this all off. For Roland, it's great to see you again. And uh, Codex all, is a uh, you know, I, just as an aside, um, I really admire what you guys have done down here. Um, entrepreneurship uh, among uh, lawyers and legal profession is something that I think we d just desperately need more of. There are a tremendous number of problems uh, to solve uh, and, a, and a wealth of opportunities um, far beyond what I'm going to, uh, oh, beautiful, far beyond what I'm going to talk about uh, here. I'm going to really focus uh, in particular uh, as you can see, I'll go back to the title. Uh, I, I'm going to talk about pricing. <laughs> um, I think when we get pricing right, uh, it is going to open up a, or unleash a torrent of new innovation and uh, new opportunities. And uh, my company, Rocket Lawyer, uh, is attacking some of the problem, but, uh, but, but by no means all of the problem. And so uh, just applaud what you guys are doing again with Codex and creating, I hope, an ecosystem where there are uh, tons of new apps and tons of new opportunities for, uh, for lawyers, entrepreneurs. Um, so I'm going to talk about pricing in, uh, in law because I think uh, innovation often starts with pricing. And how much should everyday law really cost? So... Uh, you know, there's a reason why so many people in America go without the legal care they need, and it is simple. It's too expensive. It has nothing to do with an imbalance of supply and demand, however. I mean, lawyers set prices, and there are 1.25 million lawyers in the United States Considering that there are about 313 million people, that's about one lawyer for every 250 of us. There are a lot of lawyers. There are a lot of people who need legal services. So it's not uh, necessarily supply and demand. In fact, the American legal industry employs over 2 million people. I'm a lawyer myself. There are, uh, uh, I think, too few lawyers, as a matter of fact, not too many. But when you look at that statistic and you look at the United States as being the country with the most lawyers per capita, most people say, well, there's too many lawyers. I think it's exactly the opposite. But I think we've priced ourselves out of our customers. And our customers think the same thing. We've priced our service in a way that they can't, that, that uh, most of them can't access it. And so while they need more of our services, they need more legal help, they need more legal professionals, we've all priced ourselves out of being able to deliver what they need. I mean, we our uh, most recent survey says that most people are avoiding getting the legal help they need, that 48% of them uh, report that they have avoided or postponed getting legal services. And the top reason for that, again, no surprise, it's cost. I mean, at a certain point, you have to really start listening to the customer if you're going to grow, grow a market. And so uh, the top reason is cost, 72%. Now, there are, there are other reasons. I mean, I, I'd look at uh, the 18%. Um, uh, again, back to, uh, to, our, to our company, a lot of people think Rocket Lawyer is a do-it-yourself legal service. As a matter of fact, we're not. It's about uh, doing it with someone. It's about getting the help of an attorney. That's, how, uh, that's what we have a patent on. And so uh, I completely, all of our research shows the same thing, that uh, even people who try to do it themselves, when they try to be do-it-yourselfers online, the vast majority of them need, need help. They need professional help. And so uh, I think there's a, 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 I know that there's a, a whale of an opportunity, and there are other examples and other industries that we can look at to help to show us the way. So again, you can argue that lawyers are pricing themselves out of helping regular people. 
Now, this isn't necessarily an anomaly. Just think about health care. We all need doctors and dentists. But again, you'll find that a majority of the uninsured cite that cost is the primary reason why they don't get the health care they need. The, the demand for health care, like law, however, especially preventative care, is just not being met because of prices. It really is amazing how similar our two industries are. Crises eat up all the money in the system. End of life care, as we know, we've all, we all heard the health care debate with the Affordable Care Act uh, last year and, and the year before. Uh, the majority of health care happens at the end of life when it real health care cost and expense, but it really should be happening along the way during life. That's the opportunity that we have in, in law. So much pain could be prevented in law as in health care if we could provide access to early and often counseling, documentation, and a true understanding of each patient, patient or client's unique situation and day-to-day -day needs. That's what I mean by everyday law. If you're in business, you have legal issues that come up uh, every day. My colleague uh, Jay, Jay Mandel is here. Jay was the founder of Law Pivot, which is a company that we acquired and, and, and now are working very hard to deliver a way to to get answers to quick questions anytime you need it. Because uh, that, that's where I see a great opportunity. We know people need legal care, and we know that they avoid getting it. And we know why now, which is cost. Which brings us to our next question. Why exactly are lawyers pricing themselves out of potential clients? What exactly are lawyers basing their rates on anyway? Well, for the answer to that, I, we turn to Stephen Levin. I ended up meeting the woman, fascinating woman. Freakonomics. Uh, Love and uh, actually what I ended up talking to her about was about business because uh, I'd been, after Freakonomics came out, I was anointed as a business expert. Uh, and so a lot of CEOs would call me and try to hire me. So I'd had a chance to talk to a lot of CEOs. But once I, once I talked to this prostitute about her data for about 10 minutes, I thought, my God, I've got another 30 minutes of brunch. I've got to kill topics. So I just talked to her the same way I talked to CEOs, asking her about her business, her industry. And she actually gave fantastic answers. She really seemed to understand her industry pretty well. She was a college-educated woman who had quit an $80,000 a year computer programming job to become a prostitute. Uh, in order to do it. But when I finally tripped her up, it was the same way I always trip up the CEOs. Because I asked her, how do you set prices? Okay. And the thing is, setting prices is the hardest thing. Nobody knows how to set prices because, you know, economic theory tells you how you should set prices, but, but nobody follows it. Okay. And so she gave me the same kind of terrible answers that CEOs give me. And her particular answer was, well, I just looked out on the internet to see what the other women were charging. Uh, and a lot of them were charging about $300 an hour, so that's what I decided to charge to. Sound familiar? She looked out on the internet to see what the, other, uh, the others were charging and decided on $300 an hour. Now, just because we're doing what everyone else is doing doesn't make it the right thing to do. Let's look at another, oops. Let's look at another example. This is Amanda Palmer. Let's think about how, uh, you know, the music industry is uh, probably everybody's favorite example of, of uh, a disrupted industry, recorded music. So let's take a look at how the record business went from CDs to Amanda Palmer. Now, I'd ar I would argue that music has really always been a freemium business. There have always been opportunities to get free trials of music, whether a live performance of radi or radio, TV, and from there to go on and purchase a recording. So regardless of what you may think about Amanda Palmer's art or opinions, does everybody sort of know who, who Amanda Palmer is? Okay. Um, she, she gave a, 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 a now famous 2 million download or 2 million view um, uh, TED Talk. Um, she is a what's called, known as a uh, performance uh, artist. Um, she does all sorts of wacky things. But Amanda Palmer is probably the most well-known now for uh, crowdfunding. So uh, she decided, and I'd encourage everybody to go take a look at, the, look at her TED Talk um, and some of the outrageous stuff that she does. And again, uh, regardless of what you may think about Amanda Palmer's art or opinions, she is a stunning example of what's possible in self-promotion and community support today. So instead of selling her, her uh, music, she went on Kickstarter and she just uh, asked her patrons, um, would they uh, fund her, would they support her? 
I mean, imagine if, uh, if Mozart could have done that in his time and gotten uh, uh, 25,000, in her case, patrons to, uh, to donate uh, 1.2, as of the last count, uh, about $1.2 million um, to keep her art uh, going. Now, nobody would have thought of that as a way to fund music uh, until uh, necessity was the mother of, of, of that invention. And you're seeing all sorts of interesting new, new things on Kickstarter. So uh, I don't have time to go into everything that Amanda Palmer does other than re to reiterate that she's gotten her fans to voluntarily pony up millions of dollars as a performance entrepreneur. I'm going to stay on music for a minute. Think back to the 80s and 90s. A CD at Sam Goody cost $18.99, and people were happy to pay that. Of course, in came Broadband and Napster and LimeWire and Kazaa and on and on, and suddenly even quality uh, digital music could be had for free. Recordings of, uh, sales of recordings plummeted. The music industry's initial reaction was to sue everyone else in sight and generally go temporarily insane. Again, sound familiar? But as always, consumers won. Their support for simple and elegant solutions like iTunes, Pandora, and Spotify is resulting now in people paying for more music. Artists still go platinum, but the price for consumers is way down. So yes, music consumption is different. Essentially, it's a subscription service with patrons contributing a certain amount every month to music purchases and systems that support it. How about air travel? I mean, talk about revolutionizing something. And I'm going to get, in, in, a, in a few minutes, I'm going to talk about uh, the, the difference between revolution and disruption. But Southwest, Southwest peanuts. People said they didn't want to fly or were afraid of flying, but once there was a $49 plane ticket, people started flying from Dallas to Albuquerque and a lot of other points instead of driving or taking the bus. Now, before, people said they didn't fly for all sorts of reasons, but you know what it really boiled down to? It boiled down to cost. There were a lot of uh, new air travelers just desperately out there waiting to be uh, uh, afforded the opportunity to travel like rich folks as soon as Southwest uh, Airlines gave them a price and a service that, that, that supported that price, and all of a sudden you had millions of new flyers. So it turns out there was a latent unmet demand for air travel that was unleashed by the right service at the right price. Unfortunately, we have a legal ecosystem where everyone at least pretends to offer first class, even without the champagne to go along with it. There's little acknowledgement of discount pricing and retail value in the legal marketplace. Some people don't need or even want first class. They have small legal issues. They need to make a power of attorney or an employee handbook. They don't need or can't and can't afford $300 or, heaven forbid, $1,000 an hour. And make no mistake, these people need, capital N-E-E-D, need legal care. They just aren't getting it. They don't know how, they're priced out, or we just are, just are not offering it. But there's hope. I think technology does bring hope. I think with uh, the right technology, there will be more clients uh, available. And, and I do actually believe that uh, over the long haul, we're going to have more lawyers. That per capita is going to go down um, as we have uh, better access and better pricing in the market. So that's why I think, back to this point, I think Jack Dorsey, uh, the founder of Twitter and now Square, is right when he says uh, that we should not think about disruption as much as we think about revolution. A revolution replaces one thing with another thing. That's what we have to do as innovators. And that's why I sort of come back to where I started. Um, I am uh, so excited and looking forward to seeing all the great things that are going to come out of Codex um, and, other, and, uh, and, and, and other places like uh, 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 Michigan State and what Dan Katz is doing there. And I think Dan's going to talk later. I mean, as soon as there is a more affordable, quality alternative, consumers who've ignored a market always start engaging with it. Lawyers need to understand that latent demand, and they, but they also need to understand that in order to get to those clients, they have to evolve. We have to stop fighting over the same quote-unquote first-class cases, the same high-profile cases, the same high-fee type of uh, legal matters, and we're going to have to lower costs. 
That said, it doesn't mean that any individual is going to need to make less money. Ford made uh, plenty of money by going to a Model T, going to a different type of production. There are, are in, in, to all sorts of examples of this in other markets that we can bring into the legal market. With higher efficiency, lawyers can serve more clients, and that efficiency is going to come from technology, in my opinion. So back to the future of law. In law in, back to the future. Law in 20 years is just that. I think it's more legal consumers getting legal services at a price they can afford. I don't think it's going to happen, though, with the same pricing. That doesn't mean the old model is going to go away. There are lots of complex uh, matters. And, uh, and, and, and again, in my opinion, the latent demand is for more of the simple everyday law type of things. There will still be lots of opportunity for first class. The future of law, however, is offering legal services to everyone. Innovation and technology are how we get there. Lawyers need to think like entrepreneurs. I know that you're going to see uh, through this conference lots of examples of new ways to do legal research. That's great. New ways to uh, potentially crowdsource information. That's great. Those are all ways that we can bring uh, costs down, add efficiency, and as a result, serve more people. Lawyers are going to have to think like entrepreneurs, adapt, be willing, unwilling to settle for the old way that law was practiced. We need to think of what comes next, not what, co not what came before. I really love the um, quote in Richard Susskind's book, new newest book, uh, uh, from Alexander Graham Bell, where he talks about um, people get really fixated on the doors that are closing, and as a result, they don't look at the doors that are opening. There are a tremendous number of doors opening in the legal market uh, today, if that's where we uh, point, point our uh, attention, uh, rather than trying to uh, hold on to something that, uh, frankly, the consumer is not going to let us hold on to anymore. Um, so how does that happen? Well, uh, it happens, uh, we're, all, we're partially there already. I mean, I look at all the iPads out there. People are starting to use those uh, in their practice. Lawyers are starting increasingly to give, to use Google Hangouts and things like that to give uh, consultations uh, online to eliminate uh, the friction, the need to go into, uh, in, into a lawyer's office, the need for, a, for an office altogether. All sorts of wonderful things going on in terms of virtual practice. I think that's a good, I think that's an excellent trend. We can collaborate with clients. Um, we call it Do It With Me, uh, uh, a DIWM, which is in between Do It Yourself and Do It For Me, because look, the clients have tablets, they have phones, they have computers, they can do some of the work um, themselves and make it more efficient and you can have a better uh, process that makes it uh, co costless. Um, E-Sign. E-Sign is one of my favorite uh, uh, technologies. Um, uh, it, it's interesting. I see it increasingly being used um, in practice and, and by uh, lawyers, but I think um, that's something that uh, customers, we, we actually do thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of, of electronic signatures. Um, I would love to see that happening in a more mainstream way, that that's just the way that um, uh, uh, transactional law gets practiced. And I think we're, we're, we're seeing an, a, a faster ramp uh, toward that. That is gonna bring more people into a, a digital system almost than, um, than almost anything else that, that at least I see out there. Um, so um, I'm gonna finish uh, at this point we're not, we're not there yet. Um, we are trying uh, very hard to, um, to bring law wherever people are, both um, uh, lawyers as well as the, uh, as well as the client. Um, by using uh, mobile devices, um, we had, uh, just to digress for one minute, we had a phenomenal uh, meetup, tech meetup uh, at our office last night. We had about 100 um, responsive design engineers from around San Francisco. They were at the office, and uh, the, the, the stuff that's going on with being able to bring uh, your services anywhere to any uh, device, whether it's a four-inch screen, a seven-inch screen, or, or, or a PC, is, uh, is, is, is incredible. Um, there's a ton of developer interest in it, and, um, and uh, boy, was I ever jazzed to see us geeking out last night um, with, with 100 uh, responsive design engineers on, uh, on all this type of stuff. So, so it's there, uh, it's happening, and I think it's actually accelerating. And what's fun is to see the legal market taking advantage of these new technologies. Um, other things, uh, uh, as, as we wrap up on, you know, how much should everyday law cost? Um, there, there are uh, 
uh, magnificent things going on in terms of regulation uh, or, or deregulation even in my opinion in the, in the UK um, that we can learn a lot from. Uh, we are now doing business in the UK and it's very exciting. Um, there are two million, again back where I started, two million legal professionals in the United States. I think lawyers can leverage those legal professionals in all sorts of new ways. We can leverage our paralegals, our legal secretaries, um, and use technology again to service more clients um, more uh, efficiently. Electronic filing, uh, uh, many of you are probably filing uh, uh, pleadings and other documents electronically at this point. I think that's only going to accelerate and we need new tools and solutions that certainly we can't build um, uh, to do that and I hope Codex will build some of these new tools and solutions for uh, electronic filing. So sort of in conclusion, um, uh, on the one hand, the future of laws is simple. It, it's going to continue to evolve. But I do think that evolution is accelerating and, and it's more like a revolution uh, right now. This is really, I think, our time in our market to have a dramatic change. Um, not just that, it's going to make law more affordable and um, democratize it. Those 48% of people who are postponing or not getting uh, legal help, uh, we had another uh, survey that we did that I talked about um, at, 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 um, at, at, at the reInvent Law Conference. 47% um, of the small businesses we surveyed about uh, a month and a half ago told us that um, they uh, had never gotten legal counsel. 47% of businesses had never gotten legal counsel. Um, uh, the vast majority of the businesses that call, that call us, and we handle about 200,000 calls a month, um, the vast majority of them, uh, uh, this is the first time that they will have ever uh, spoken to a professional about their legal problem when we help them to get uh, the, the assistance of an attorney. And so uh, uh, th there is just a, 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 a huge, if I leave you with anything, there is a huge untapped well. It's like the Bakken oil field, you know, up in uh, North Dakota. There, but, but, but we couldn't get at that oil uh, in, at the Bakken Reserve without new technology, without doing it differently. There was no way to get at those uh, oil reserves uh, using uh, the, the standard drills and standard technology that, that we had used for 100 years of, of, uh, of oil drilling before. There's no way, it's not going to happen, to get at that 48% of people who are postponing legal services or the 47% of small businesses that, businesses that have never consulted with a lawyer. There's absolutely no way to get at that market without doing things differently and without new technology. I know we're going to get there. We're already uh, doing it, and I can't wait to see what others are going to talk about today. So thank you.